First, let me say public office is really important to have more women and people of color in state legislatures, in local city councils, and also at the federal level. Because when you get women and people of color in these state houses, they make new policies for society. They change society. So that is philanthropist Melinda French Gates. She's, of course, a co-founder of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, one of the world's largest nonprofits. That foundation has given away more than $70 billion in grants. A longtime advocate for women and girls, she is now focusing on getting more women elected to public office. French Gates explains why in a recent op-ed, quote, only one in three state legislatures in the U.S. is a woman, and at the federal level, it's closer to one in four. There is evidence that women govern differently, working more collaboratively across party lines and introducing legislation on issues that have historically gone unaddressed. I spoke with her yesterday about those efforts, also her concerns about AI and life now after her very public divorce from Bill Gates. Here's part of our conversation. So you start this op-ed in time, writing, in 1976, Annabelle Clement O'Brien, known as the first lady of Tennessee politics, ran for office on the slogan, a woman's place is in the House and the Senate, too. Why is so much of your effort and your money going to getting more women elected? Well, because I believe women should have their full power and influence in the United States. And in 2019, I made a billion dollar commitment to ensure that really starts to happen more with more momentum. And I'm just seeing that we aren't there yet. You know, too often we have decisions made, being made for women, not by women. Mm -hmm. And as she said, and also as Ruth Bader Ginsburg said, I believe women should be every place that decisions are being made. And that's just, we're just not not there yet as a country. What's interesting about your effort is you're really keenly focused on state legislatures. Why? Mm -hmm. Well, I'm focused on making sure that women have the rightful place at all levels of governing. But state legislators are particularly important. There are 7,000 seats at the legislative level at states. They control $2 trillion in resources, and they make really important policies and laws that affect everyone in their state. So really focusing there where there's so many seats, but also for those women who do want to go on and be in the halls of Congress, it's a great training ground for that. Democrats and Republicans, you want to help across parties? Of course. We need our government to represent all of us. And we have different points of view, depending on, on what state you're in, depending on your political leaning. So absolutely, both sides of the aisle. So former Republican Congresswoman Liz Cheney was quite blunt speaking in New York this week. Here's what she said. What we've done in our politics is create a situation where we're electing idiots. <laughs> and um, and so I, I don't look at it through the lens of like, you know, is this what I should do or what I shouldn't do? I look at it through the lens of how do we elect serious people? And I think electing serious people can't be partisan. I'm wondering if you agree, if you think that electing more women helps solve that problem. I think we need to make sure that everyone in this country's voice is represented. So whether that's a female, whether that's a male, and we have to realize we just aren't there yet. One in three state legislators are women. One in four are women in Congress. And yet we're 50% of the population. How can we have 16 million black women in this country, yeah. but zero black senators? So we know that point of view isn't being represented, and we need to do more to make sure that women are represented. I, I obviously couldn't help but notice you wrote this. This was published really at the one-year mark of Roe versus Wade being overturned. Was that a coincidence? Not at all a coincidence. I mean, to have a law on the books for almost 50 years around women's reproductive rights and then have it rolled back. And when you really go and talk to and re do the research about what do Americans believe, they believe that law should be in place. Yeah. So to me, it was a decision, again, where a decision made for women, not by women. We should never roll back a law like that that has to do with women's health. That's a very private, hard, emotional decision. The government shouldn't be involved and hasn't been involved in 50 years. So why would we change that? This 
reminded me of something you said a long time ago when I when I spoke to you. You said that your mother taught you set your own agenda or someone else will. Does all of this really stem from that set your own agenda or someone else will? Yes, because the agenda being set by the United States is being set by a group of people that doesn't represent all of us. And what we know is that women, when they come into halls of power, they introduce new pieces of legislation that have historically not been there because they have a different lens on society. And so this is about making sure we set the agenda for all the American people. Our democracy should represent us, and it does not today. So in all of my years of interviewing you, you have never endorsed publicly. Am I right, a candidate? I think that's right. Does this change? Does that change now, Melinda? No, I I have given personal resources and continue to give personal resources to many candidates on both sides of the aisle, but I don't endorse a specific person. But can I ask office. you why, if you're you're really putting a lot more money and energy behind politics and getting women elected and behind causes that you're passionate about, Roe versus Wade being overturned as an example, why not publicly endorse if there are candidates in this next cycle that you think are necessary in office? Because I vote in any election on both sides of the aisle. Sometimes I vote Republican, mm. sometimes Democratic. I'm a very independent voter, and I don't want to be pegged as one or the other. I think that the best policy is made when we reach across the aisle. And so I think if I come out for a particular candidate, they're going to say, oh, she always supports Republicans or she always supports a Democrat. And that's just not true. So many people are focused on artificial intelligence now. And you've been warning for years, not just about what is ahead with AI, but about bias built into AI. And you've equated it to the bias built into the Constitution, right? And who was mm -hmm. the Constitution written by? How how nervous are you that that could be uh, playing out again when it comes to AI? I'm very nervous because we don't have enough women, again, who are computer scientists and who have expertise in artificial intelligence. And without that, we will bake bias into the system. Again, the system needs to take all people's points of view in and see society and, quite frankly, see the world writ large as it is. When you have women at any of these places, when you're creating something, when you're making this decision, when you're setting a law, you're bringing that perspective of society that is just so vitally important. You have, uh, Melinda, described this moment in your life as incredibly joyful. Um, so many uh, people in America and around the world have gone through painful divorce. Can you talk a little bit about your journey and finding this joy? Mm, I think, you know, you have to look for it every day. And so even when you go through a painful time, which I did for several years, you you gather these moments of joy during the day and then you reflect on them at the end of the week. And so I happen to be in a situation now in life where, you know, I have a granddaughter, my three children are out of the house now. And so I just really surround myself with family and friends who bring me a lot of energy and joy so that when I do go out in the world and do this kind of work or I travel to places that are very difficult, um, I can lean into that joy and lean into that network of family and friends that support us. I think, Poppy, um, we talked about this a little yesterday after the interview, and then I'll acknowledge candidly, I went back and was watching the feed in our system. Um, to, to, <laughs> to, just because I was very interested in the, the actual interview itself. But you mentioned it yesterday, and I want to follow up on it, because your perspective on the non-endorsements, yeah, particularly when you take a very straightforward line on Roe versus Wade. Um, and I've seen a lot of people with a lot of money in politics try and strike this middle ground. And within a year or two, their grand efforts have completely faded away. Why? What was your Why doesn't your she endorse? I think you heard her say there because she's not just a Democrat, not just a Republican. She's an independent, but you could still endorse certain candidates. I think right. she doesn't want to alienate people. I think she believes that she can make change without publicly saying who, not just with money, but with resources, with the writing that, that she does. But it was really interesting. Um, it's just been fascinating over the last decade to watch her evolution yeah. in terms of such support of women and girls, and now really in politics. And as you heard, the timing of this on the one-year mark when Roe was overturned was, was not a coincidence at all. I think you're going to see and hear a lot more from Melinda Gates on this front. Maybe one day she will endorse. We'll see. We'll see. I did ask, are oh. you going to run? Is she going to run?
No, never. Not a chance. Never. Okay. Yeah, that seemed pretty obvious, at least <laughs> implicitly. All right, great interview, Poppy. Thank you.